UCC's online worship service for Sunday, August 2nd. All of the staff and church leaders continue to hope and pray that you are staying safe and well. Along those lines, after communications with the Knox County Health Department, Church Council and Pastor Scott have prayerfully and carefully decided for safety reasons to continue to only have online worship in August. After the work in the sanctuary is fully complete, Council plans to have discussions in late August to consider if we could return to in-person services in September. My name is Laura Ackert. I'm the music director and the liturgist this morning. I'm going to read the lectionary psalm and the gospel scriptures for today. Pastor Scott Elliott will then preach a sermon and provide a pastoral prayer and benediction. Our pianist this morning is Krista Brady, and she just played a wonderful introit and will play the final hymn, Be Thou My Vision. We also encourage you to look up hymns or music online to help you in worship and meditation and prayer. Also, we are having an online commun communion in this service. If you want to stop the video to get some bread and juice or substitutes, now would be a good time. All are invited to commune in our church. You do not have to be a member of our particular faith. If you would like to partake, we are glad to have you do so. We turn now to our scripture readings. Here is our lectionary psalm, Psalm 17, verses 1 through 7 and verse 15. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths, my feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their ad adversaries at your right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. And for our lectionary lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures, I am reading Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jacob. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. 
Through these words, our God is still speaking. Thanks be to our still speaking God. Well, thank you, Krista, and thank you, Laura, and good morning, uh, good day, good evening, whatever time it is for you out there. We're glad that you're joining us. A couple of weeks ago, we considered a Bible story about Jacob, a different one, the one where he flees Canaan after deceiving his brother and his father. We learned that on the first night of that earlier flight, Jacob awoke to God's presence in his life after a dream with angels going up and down a ladder and God standing by his side, promising to be with him always and promising him the promise land. Jacob discovered that God was there in his time of trouble, and he hadn't even known it. Today's lectionary text picks up Jacob's story many, many years later. He's actually fleeing back home and encounters God again, who seems to be a, a sort of gatekeeper to the homeland, the promised land, at, at least for Jacob. In the time between Jacob's first encounters with God in a dream and the encounter in the lesson that Laura just read so nicely, 20 years and a whole bunch of events have transpired. After Jacob's dream, he continued running away to Haran, a home of his ancestors, where his mother Rebekah's brother Laban still lived. An uncle Laban had two daughters, Rachel and her eldest sister Leah, and Jacob marries both of them. As I mentioned a few sermons ago, the ancient Near East was a very different and strange place that first cousins could marry as a small part of that. A bigger and much more, more troubling part is that women like Rachel and Leah had very little to say in who they married. They were considered property and they were basically sold by their father after he bargained with Jacob, who then owned them. And to make matters worse, a man could own multiple wives and concubines simultaneously, which Jacob did. And the disturbance we feel at this mistreatment of women is God calling out to us in the story still that mistreatment of people is wrong. It's not seeking justice or loving kindness. It is decidedly not loving your neighbor or doing unto others as you would have done to yourself. Uncle Laban, although related to Jacob, was not a Hebrew but an Aramean, and he did not just mistreat women, he mistreated Jacob. Laban is unjust and unkind to him. He deceived Jacob into working seven years for Rachel, only to trick him into marrying Leah instead. And then Laban forced Jacob to agree to stay and provide another seven years of labor for Rachel. Continuing his misbehavior, Laban connived and deceived Jacob over livestock ownership. And Jacob, no stranger to trickery himself, responded in kind, deceiving Laban in return. And all of this trickery in the family and the presence of two wives, Leah and Rachel, and two concubines, Zilpah and Bilhah, in the household being treated as property made things messy and unfair for the entire family well into the future. Jacob had children with all four women for a total of 12 sons and a daughter. And all of the mothers and all of the children competed for preferential treatment by Jacob, which Rachel and her sons unfairly received to the dismay of others. Jacob's sons eventually become the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And later, all the messiness and the sexism plays a role in the terrible mistreatment of Dinah, the daughter. And the messiness uh, of the dysfunction in the family also permeates the famous narrative where Rachel's son Joseph is later given a robe of many colors and other preferential treatment. I'm not going to further address the Joseph or the Dinah narratives today, but I wanted to note the ripple effects of misdeeds and oppression.
impression travel in time then as they do now. God's voice can still be heard calling to us to avoid such injustice and unkindness. Before the stories of Dinah and Joseph, while Jacob and the family are in Haran and under the oppression of Laban, before today's story, God instructs Jacob to return to the homeland that he fled 20 years ago. And obeying God in this regard, Jacob sneaks away with his family and flocks in tow, and Rachel also grabs her dad's idols before they go. And when Laban learns they've run away, he chases them down and catches up to them. And after a bit of a confrontation, Laban and Jacob make peace, and Jacob and his family are allowed to continue their track to the homeland. And our lectionary text for today picks up the story as Jacob is getting close to home, and he has begun to worry about encountering his brother Esau, whose murderous threats after Jacob stole his inheritance caused Jacob to flee in the first place. Jacob just learned Esau was approaching with an army, and in an effort to try and appease his brother to begin to make peace, Jacob sent gifts. And then to protect his belongings, Jacob divided the family in two, and as we heard, he led them across the river to encamp and wait for him. And when this family settled in, Jacob crossed back over to the river to spend the night alone, preparing to meet Esau in the morning. And while we might expect Jacob to have tossed and turned or have another dream, what happened next is neither of those things. Something so strange has reported to have occurred that theologians and clergy and laity have been discussing it for at least 3,000 years, maybe even more. We're going to take a detailed look at the strange report and briefly join in the age-old discussion about this tax today. First, we are told rather pithily that Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And while that is short and might seem simple, the brief details are already strange. We're told Jacob is left alone, yet we're told um, there was someone else there, a man, and they wrestled. But for a great many hours, this is an all through the night, dusk to dawn, grapple, not some battle. And at daybreak, the wrestlers appeared to be even in the match until in a final effort to win, the man managed to wound Jacob, popping his hip out of joint. And then in what sounds like a hope that Jacob would cry uncle to end the fight, the man said, let me go, for day is breaking. The wounded and exhausted, Jacob holds on and won't cry uncle. He didn't give up, but replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We still think Jacob's opponent is a man at this point, and he said to Jacob, what's your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And what happens next is most extraordinary. We learn the man is God when he tells Jacob, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And at this news, Jacob wants the name of God. Jacob asks, please tell me your name. And we know that later Moses asks that question of God in a burning bush and gets a strange non-answer answer, I am who I am. But with Jacob, God answers the question with a non-answer question. Why is it that you ask my name, God says. And then God blesses Jacob. So here's what we know from the words in the story so far. Jacob was alone in the desert on the border of the promised land for a second time, but God does not gently appear in a dream. This time God shows up for real, and Jacob wrestles with God all through the darkness, and at the end of the darkness and the wrestling, Jacob's hip breaks. He has a physical injury, but his spirit does not break. He does not let go of God. And then as daylight breaks, Jacob is reading Israel and is blessed by God. The name Jacob is thought to mean heel, trickster, 
overreacher. It's a plant that has negative connotations. The name Israel is thought to mean something more positive, like God rules, God preserves, God protects. It's a lot more positive. Our lesson wraps up with Jacob calling the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And then Jacob literally limps off into the sunrise. The sun rose upon him as he named, as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. That's a pretty dramatic story all on its own. It is strange and compelling, but, but can we find meaning in it or meanings in it? One meaning often found is that the story represents something along the line of the nation Israel and its people struggle with both man and God in the dark times of life. And as a result, Israel has been wounded and blessed, but is protected by God through the darkness and brought in to the daylight. I like that. I can see that. It's a solid metaphoric truth. That's a, a fair summary of the story of God's people, all of God's people. While Jacob the man would have lived 3,500 to 4,000 years ago, the story is thought to have been recorded much later when the kingdom of Israel had formed and, and the Hebrew tribes had left behind the darker times of loosely knitted nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes with the clan um, leaders and judges. By the time the story was first written down, Israel had struggled through all of that coming to its own, wounded and limping from entanglements with man and God, but blessed all the same and protected under the United Kingdom and kings. All that can be found echoing in our reading today, and there is hope and promise in that movement into light and the lesson of God and goodness resulting in the people of God named Israel. I like that meta-narrative meta approach and its influence on the corporate cohesiveness and growth and goodness moving into the promise of dawn and a new day of light. But I, but I think we can find in the story a voice and narrative that speaks to us today as individuals and a people. Jacob is as a symbol of change who emerges out of the darkness, much of it comes by his own dark deeds of deceit and oppression that created messiness. Jacob finally meets and wrestles with God face to face outside of dreams and wistful thinking. The wounds of his misdeeds become visible and painful. His sins have hurt him as well as hurt others. And when he identifies himself as Jacob, he is naming his sins as heel, trickster, overreacher, supplanter, and he is made aware of his dark deeds and then lives with the consequences of them, even as that awareness becomes the blessing of a new identity, a new way of being. He moves forward, even if limping with his past and some of the sins that he continues to commit. He moves into the dawning light as Israel through whom and whom God rules, God preserves, God protects. And sure enough, the, the new man Israel is at least a trickster no more. He moves beyond Laban's oppression of him and his tricks on Laban and his tricks on Esau. Those wounds heal. But tragically and sadly, the patriarchal injustices to women do not end and in many respects still continue to this day, wounding generation after generation. We limp as a people. We are all wounded by that culture. Like Jacob, we limp with the injuries. And it's our call to listen to God and end them, even if that is not the focus of the patriarchal telling of this story 3,000 years ago. And the story, though, does provide a blueprint for how to deal with sins. The right? first thing Israel did under his new identity was make recompense and change his sinful ways and he meets with his victim Esau and asks for forgiveness for his sins and the two of them make peace at least with regards to those sins. 
In those successful peace efforts, the newly named Israel actually sees the face of God. Israel's not perfect after he faced God and faced off with God, but he's a much better person. He realizes the injury he caused Esau and himself, and he moved into the light. Even if limping with the wounds, he discovered wrestling with God. If Jacob, the trickster, can be reinvented as no less than Israel, who God rules, God preserves, and God protects, we can too. And one thing Israel fails to do in the patriarchal telling of the story is something that wounds us still, and we can, and we should work to remedy it. It is to answer the call of God to not mistreat women, to instead treat them as the full and equal image of God they have been created as since the start. Genesis tells us that in the first book of the Bible. That lesson applies, of course, to anyone being oppressed women, LGBTQ, people of color, those of other faiths, those other abled, and the poor. We need to change our ways and stop the wounding, stop the oppression. We need to seek justice and love kindness and humbly walk with God. That's the wrestling we need to do to continue the job of moving into the light that Jacob began with God pulling him, wrestling him, getting him to do that. The promised line of peace on earth, goodwill to all is on the other side of wrestling with those issues with God. And God's the gatekeeper still to the promised land. And we need to struggle with God's call to seek justice and love kindness to move toward it still. That's a lesson we can find in the story. Amen. Well, for our prayer today, I, I want to lift up as we have been um, health care workers and essential workers, and you all, I want to especially lift up our good friend Susan and also our good friend and sister Meg as they continue uh, to have um, health issues in their family. I don't want to lift up the leaders of nations, the leaders of our nation, to please let them be prayerful and careful and to listen where God's calling and lead us there. I ask you now if you would please join me in prayer. God of Israel, God of us all, please let your healing and comforting presence be experienced by our brothers and sisters on our, our own prayers. As we as we also ask that your healing and comforting presence be experienced by all those this morning who are sick and in need of care. And for loved ones lost, and those who have lost loved ones. We thank you, God, for all those joining us online in whatever holy and sacred space they are watching. May your word and the love that fills the world and the spaces we occupy be a blessing to us all. And may our offerings of gifts to you be a blessing in the world. God, we thank you for your presence with us in our own deserts and our own foibles and sins like Jacob. We do not meet you without messiness and dysfunctions in our life. We wrestle with you too in many of those darknesses. Help us as we grapple to come out of the darkness still holding on to you and transform to our better self. Thank you for being with us in the dark and in the light when we are misbehaving and when we are not. Help us, though, to see our misbehavior, our sins and injustices, and to learn from them so that we do not hurt others or ourselves. Help us, God, to be that best self you want us to be, and help us want to be that best self too. God, help us, uh, especially to treat women and all other people that are oppressed as equal images of you, God. Nothing more and nothing less than that. And now, God, hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Right now, if you haven't already done it, you might want to stop and get some bread and wine or juice or other substitutions for a communion because we're, we're going to have our online communion right now. Um, please know, like Laura said, everyone is invited to the Lord's Supper at our church. It doesn't matter what you believe or don't believe. It doesn't matter if you're a member or a non-member. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday you think about doing later today or tomorrow. Right now, if you would like to partake in communion, please know that you are most welcome and invited to do so. On this Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we remember that uh, on the night that Jesus was turned over to the authorities on the eve of his death, he gathered for one last meal with his followers. And sometime during that meal, he took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his followers, saying, Take eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. Gracious God, pour your spirit into this cup, into this bread in each person who is joining us for communion today, so that we might all know your unconditional love that lasts forever, and that we can discover it through the body, and the spirit, and the presence of Jesus, our brother and our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, these are the gifts of God, and they are for all of God's people. Come for all things are ready. If you would take some bread, we are going to partake of bread of life. When you are ready, Take the cup to partake of the cup of blessing. If you would now, please join me again in prayer, oh God. Thank you for this spiritual meal on all the holy ground we have partaken in with all the holy people who have partaken it with us. Thank you for the unconditional love for which it represents and evidences. Lead us to embrace that love and to be a part of it. Amen. Well, I want to thank Laura and Krista again for continuing to work with me and, and be a part of the worship team on these online services. Thanks to Charlotte and Scott Mickley for their continued technical support. And thanks to all of you for joining us. May God bless you and keep you. God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and, and give you peace. And go in peace, knowing that you are loved and that you matter much. <laughs>